Um, I'm John Stack. I'm the Digital Director of the Science Museum Group. And so our project is called uh, Heritage Connector, and it is um, a collaboration between ourselves, um, the School of Advanced Study at the University of London, the VA, and obviously funded through um, the HRCs towards the National Collection Programme. So um, I'll go through a bit of who we are, then what challenges that we're trying to overcome, what we're doing, what we've learned so far, and then what we're doing next. Uh, so this is us, um, the, the kind of core project team, and there are other people working around the edges. So uh, uh, Carolyn Dutta, who is our research software developer, Rhian Lewis, our project coordinator, and myself, Jamie Onion, uh, uh, Jamie Onion, Jamie Unwin, who's our technical architect for collections, Jane Winters from the School of Advanced Study, and Angela Wolf from the VMA. Um, so our kind of core research question is, how can existing tools and methods be used to build relationships at scale between poorly and inconsistently catalogued and digitized uh, collection objects and other content sources? So I think one of the key things in there to understand is these are like existing tools that we're customizing and, and working with rather than massively building lots of new tools ourselves. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what that customization and those methods are in a bit. Um, so we, like a lot of other cultural heritage collections, are undertaking ongoing uh, digitization of, of the collection. Um, and like a lot of other people, the, the, the approach is really around um, breadth over depth. So getting as many records online, um, but not necessarily having the, the associated uh, content um, as deep as you might like. Um, and then like everybody else, the primary way in which uh, the content is discovered is by kind of, it's by keyword search. Um, and fundamentally what that's doing is it's taking keywords that are put into a search box and then running them over various fields in the collection catalog. And then it's ranking those results um, in some way. And then and, and, and the ways in which it's ranked depend on different organizations and might take different things into consideration. Um, for the most part, we, like others, forego a really uh, granular advanced search. And the reason for that is, which might allow you to sort of put in place sort of combinations of keywords and filters and so on, because the collection catalog is just too thin. Um, and although there'd probably be few or no false positives, it's likely that an enormous amount of material that you were the user was searching for would actually be missed. So the approach that we've gone for, and uh, like others, is 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 a, is a kind of single keyword search that searches across fields, and then there are kind of filters based on your search results that allow you to kind of drill down a bit. So it's a little bit of a kind of working with the data that we have and making the best of it. Um, which means that fundamentally, the discovering the uh, contents of the collection has a whole bunch of steps which have a whole bunch of problems with them at each point. So the first one is even knowing that the collection exists. The second is understanding that it might contain relevant contents and our collection is actually extremely diverse. So there's lots of things that people are genuinely surprised that we have in our collection. Um, then there's knowing that that content is actually available online. Of course, not all of it is. And then once you get to our site, you've got to navigate this keyword-based search, and then you've got to kind of be able to make some sense of the search results and see how they're relevant for the thing you're potentially interested in. And then once you've got to the stuff, ideally you'd be able to like navigate from that stuff um, to related stuff. So fundamentally, search discovery is data-driven for us and for everybody else. But, but for the most part, the collection catalog, ours and others are, are, are quite unstructured. Uh, they're very variable in consistency in terms of just even uh, how we've applied our own cataloging standards and how those have changed over, over time. And the collection catalog is overwhelmingly composed of very, very um, thin records. Um, it's also incomplete uh, and it's forever a work in progress. Uh, and then it contains all the kind of biases in both in content and emissions and cataloging and so on that you would uh, expect. Um, it's also structured in a very tabular format, and I'll come back to that in a second. So some of these things that you see on the left-hand side there on this page from our collection website are, are literally tables in 
our collection management system. Um, so overall, it, I guess it's an okay experience, um, but we're definitely hitting as a sector, as an institution and as a sector, the limits of uh, what we can do with um, collection data and these kinds of interfaces and therefore the kinds of research, discovery, exploration, scholarship that you can kind of get out of the systems in this way. Um, so often the conversation then turns to, well, we just need to like catalog everything in, in an incredible level of detail. Um, and that's a much harder thing to scale up than it is imaging because it needs kind of deep, deep curatorial expertise. So that work is ongoing and it is prioritized, but it's the task of like decades, not years. Um, and so there's ambitions for kind of rich discovery interfaces or being able to kind of view collections by topics or themes or being able to present the collection as a whole so that a researcher or a member of the public can kind of grasp what's there uh, are all really uh, falling flat at the moment. Um, and so in our first um, uh, convening, one of the things we asked uh, um, the public Oh, those were the participants was around um, the extent to which they were using external identifiers, which could then kind of build links between the collection and pull in more data to kind of potentially augment this. And 59% of them said this, the major hurdle was time and resource. And we've heard that. So it essentially comes to the same problem that we had with um, uh, improving the catalog is that it's a lot of manual labor. Um, and of course, once you then start to apply the you think about joining two or more collections together um the uh, the current approach of kind of keyword search actually risks providing an even worse experience because the catalog data and the approach taken um don't align neatly um and a computer that's providing a search index does need them to be aligned neatly so aggregation platforms like art uk have to put quite a lot of uh, energy and effort into into aligning um catalogs uh in order to join collections together and arguably that's much simpler for an art collection than it is for a kind of multidisciplinary collection like ours or the um v &As. okay so then our project uh, is really looking at three things um the first is looking at knowledge graphs as a way as an alternate way to capture and store and access um the collection catalog the second is looking at linked data as a way to make that content um, interoperable, but also machine readable. And then it's looking at artificial intelligence as a way to um, generate the knowledge graph and the linked data. Um, so in terms of like using these three technologies against uh, sort of content rich discovery systems, that's what this these people do. You've probably heard of them. This is how Netflix works, Pinterest, Airbnb, and so on. So, so it's a tried and tested method outside of our uh, sector. Uh, and if we can um, get it right, there are probably um, some areas in which we'll see immediate benefits. So first of all, we could improve collection user interfaces. I think we're primarily, primarily talking about online. Uh, we can improve discovery because we'll have a kind of richer data set to work with. And then we'll improve links to other data sources, which means we can literally make links, but it also means we can draw the stuff from those links back in and put them alongside um, our collections. Um, so a little bit on what we're doing to get into some of the detail. So this is like how collection catalogs exist. Uh, so within a collection management system. So when I say they're tabular, what I mean is it's like a big Excel spreadsheet with lots of interlinked cells and cells can be full or they can be empty, but, they, but it's quite a sort of rigid format and changing them is very complicated uh, and tends to need to go to a committee. Um, and they um, tend to um, be quite complicated to replicate um, online. Uh, because fundamentally, if a cell is empty, there's just there's nothing uh, that can be queried against that cell. And um, in order to um, link to additional places and additional sources of uh, potential content, which could be articles or it could be other collections and so on, you'd literally have to add other tables in. So what we've been looking at 
a knowledge graphs. So knowledge graphs are structured less as a set of like structured tables and more as uh, a list of relationships between things. So the things that knowledge graphs do well is they can handle very complicated relationships um, of the kind that you find in cultural heritage collections. They can hold many different kinds of um, relationships. So they, so a knowledge graph around a collection can actually hold more types of relationships than were represented in the um, structure on the left hand side. They can calculate things like closeness and relationships very, very quickly. So you can do things like draw together related things um they can they can bridge across disparate kinds of content without the need to merge the data sets together and then perhaps the key one is they're very flexible and they can grow and change very easily um so then the last thing is they can be machine readable so the first line here is a human readable piece of text the second line is a kind of description of what that text is so the person's the person, uh, the the relationship with the second the second thing, and then the place in which they were born, and then at the bottom you can see that that is a machine readable um, set of data. So I can very quickly look at everybody who has a birthplace or everybody who is has a, any kind of relationship with Tunbridge, and that's the sort of thing that a knowledge graph can do very very quickly and effectively. But we're we're querying tables as in the left-hand side, would be quite sort of slow and cumbersome. Uh, so then where does the artificial intelligence bit come in? Um, so there's three parts to what we're doing to build this knowledge graph, or this kind of prototype knowledge graph from our collection and the VNX collection. The first is looking at where there are existing identifiers and URLs stored in our collection management system. So those of you who are watching on Friday, would have seen the um, presentation on persistent identifiers. Actually, one of the things that might come out of our project, spoiler alert for the final report, is actually anything where you've got a persistent identifier or indeed any kind of link or identifier is a really, really valuable thing. Even if a curator only has two minutes to stick that into a field somewhere, what this approach shows is you can actually build really quite impressive things on top of it. Um, and the second part is building links between um, our collection and Wikidata. So, um, so Wikidata is the um, data set that underpins Wikipedia. And part of the reason we're using it is one, it's uh, it's an open data set, so we can just like download the whole thing and play with it. Uh, second is it it's open licensed, which means that we can build on top of it without having to deal with um, rights issues. And the third is it covers a very broad um, subject domain. So we can sort of range very widely across um, different topics and subjects. And then the third part is building links from within texts using named entity recognition. So I'd quickly dig into each of these things, but fundamentally what you should think of these things as is um, they're all forms of machine learning. And machine learning is really just about um, finding patterns. So we're using uh, tools that are designed for finding patterns and things. And in some instances, we can just use them right off the bat. In some instances, and I'll talk a bit about those, we're having to refine the tools and train them a bit ourselves. Um, but we're getting some good um, insights into the kind of work that's involved um, in using artificial intelligence um, and these other techniques uh, across heritage collections. So on the left-hand side is our collection data. Uh, we're running it through these processes. Um, on the left, and then we're building this knowledge graph that we're then using a, a bunch of tools to build links to Wikidata so that we can use that um, data set to both uh, draw in data from there, but also use it as the kind of stepping down to other places. Um, so I'll go through each of the three steps that I described. So the first is around, uh, this is kind of the simplest one, is just trawling through, finding links, seeing if we can resolve those links uh, against Wikidata. And sometimes they're not even links to Wikidata, but using this technique, we can actually find, is that link also referenced somewhere else in Wikidata? And if it is, we can pull back the identifier. So very quickly, everything, and there was about 10,000 things in our collection, which had a link which we could us usefully use. And, and all of those things were just put into the system at some point into the collection management system, not with this in mind, but just because that will be useful one day. And here we are, it was useful. 
Uh, so the second part is around building um, links to Wikidata. Um, and so we put a tool that learns to distinguish between um, our internal records and, and Wikidata records and try and work out if are, those are the same things. Um, generally speaking, if we wanted to uh, train such a thing yourself, you'd need really a large volume of data. And actually, although we think of museum collections as huge, they're not actually big enough. <laughs> in that instance so we've uh we've selected a method which uh uses kind of less computational power and tries to then uh, build these links and then put a kind of a percentage of certainty um against it so that's the second step and then the third, third step is looking at records that have um free text in them so this is um helen charman's spacesuit and you can see there's a whole bunch of text there and so we can take that text and using um, natural language processing, we can start to go through and analyze the, um, uh, the things mentioned in the text um, and trying to draw out uh, specific things and build, uh, but also to turn those into links. So in this instance, you can see that we've been able to build a link to Helen Sharman, uh, and that's a top left one is an internal one, but those other ones which are, around uh, the, the mission, the company that um, uh, produces, uh, manufacturing the space suit and so on, um, are not things that exist in our database, they're external things They exist um, in those QIDs or actually wiki data IDs. So suddenly this has gone from just a raw piece of text to which a keyword search was kind of trawling through to something where uh, we now have links to those other things. And because we have links to them, we can see other things in our collection or anywhere else that also has other links and those things. We can also infer other information um, between those things. So um, we've been then looking at, okay, how do you make these things better? How do you constantly um, look at the results you're getting and then iterate through and try and improve the, um, uh, the quality of the records coming back? So an obvious one is, um, and lots of people who've worked with museum collection data will know that a date is not a date ever, uh, but they do follow a number of formats. So you can actually train a computer to recognize all the different formats that have been used for dates that have been used by curators over the years. So here's an example, we've written this, now it will go back in and it will be much better at identifying dates. Or the one that we found um, that's in the example at the bottom is, Lots of things are personal place or institution names, co the collection. And so um, seeing that as a pattern, we've gone back in and uh, told the machine or trained the machine to recognize if something follows the name collection, um, that, that's, that's an entity um, in itself. Um, and then we've been looking at actually, how do you feed in all of the possible things that um, uh, uh, is a bulk way of helping the machine understand um, the kinds of entities that we'd want to add. And actually looking at the collection itself, those things were often contained. So one of the things that it's kind of stumbled over is names of companies, for example, are often people's names. So um, uh, T Green and Sun Limited, so the computer automatically jumps onto T Green and says that's a person, but the Ansun Limited is the thing that turns it into a company. So actually having all of this structured information around names of people, name of companies, names of organizations, um, names of places versus the place name and the word company on the end um, means that we can actually sort of ingest this, this back in and put it back into the process. Uh, and that significantly improves the link building um, uh, capabilities. So fundamentally what we're doing is we're, work, we're moving some from something that looks like this. So the stuff in our collection with a relatively small number of links between it to something that's much more richly interlinked and contains links uh, to other places. And uh, we can then build on top of that. So the preliminary findings from the first year um, Cultural heritage databases are rich, complex, large, and they have limited standardization. And fundamentally, standardization is really challenging because of the kind of culture and the resources needed. Um, the motivations for working with linked data 
are around making the content more visible, exposing hidden or hidden aspects of collection, enriching them, as I mentioned, reading the data in different contexts and providing better um, user experience. Uh, working with linked data at any kind of scale is time consuming and resource intensive, which is why a lot of the projects that have worked in this field in the past have often been pilots, um, or they've other been pilots were incredibly well funded and collaborations between multiple institutions. Um, so there are existing tools for doing this kind of work manually, uh, but they, it takes a significant amount of time. And we've already been able to demonstrate that actually very quickly, we can use some of the techniques I've described to uh, build something really quite robust. Um, we've been looking at what are the best processes for doing this and actually using the tools iteratively has definitely been um, uh, proven to be more effective than thinking this is a sort of run once approach. Um, and so we're doing quite a lot of running things, looking at the results, running, changing it, running the, running the thing again. Um, and the more entities and relationships that we create, the better the, the system is getting at um, learning um, about our collection and learning about identifying the entities and building links with them. Uh, building links to wiki data is really, really variable depending on the type of thing. So it's quite good at people, companies, um, events and so on, but it's not very good at objects. We've only got a handful of objects that have, um, uh, you know, one-to-one -one relationships in wiki data. Uh, it's not a question of if human event intervention and in curation is needed, but at what point it should be used and where it should be focused. So I mentioned earlier that where curators have put links into the collection management system, we were able to use those um, very, very quickly. But at some point, human beings aren't going to need to be involved in this process. And that sort of should come as no surprise, because obviously the examples I gave earlier with um, um, Airbnb and Pinterest and so on, clearly there are people working behind the scenes making those things better all the time. So the things that we are working on next. Uh, so we're currently in the process of ingesting the v &A's collection alongside that of the Science Museum group, because then we can see, we can sort of present the two collections together and we can see um, where links exist or don't exist or should exist between the two. Uh, we're looking to extend beyond collections on Wikidata to see about, about um, ingesting other kinds of text content. So can we scan other things, blog posts, articles, and so on, and, and start to put out entities that are mentioned there and build a link between those and the knowledge graph. Uh, we're gonna build and test our internal link creation method. So this is fundamentally uh, what we're doing, but, um, but we want to build something and package, up, package it up as something that could be, uh, repurposed uh, again um, more broadly in the future. Uh, and then we want to explore the kinds of new forms of interaction and discovery, which in practice, this kind of approach um, could um, facilitate. Thanks very much. So we've got a project page, there's a blog, there's a very extensive Zotero library with many, many articles in it that we read, that we've got a YouTube channel, and obviously there's a GitHub repository with lots of code.